often begin um, just a brief background of me and Mar. I am going to start off on pretty much the entire story. So we both had the same major at university. Actually, I came in as an IT major and then I changed to advertising and PR. She was in the program as well. And um, when you're in the program with somebody, but you never talk. So the last year of senior project, uh, my teacher, Christy Frudenrich, and her teacher as well, wanted me to join um, the advertising club, which is a senior project, because she wanted me to present, because I'm apparently I can talk very well in front of crowds. Who knew? So I get into the entire club and everything, and still we're just doing classwork, like nothing. And um, at the time, I didn't really think I would have a shot with her. So you kind of just put that into the back of your mind. So this is the part I'm just going to speed through so it's not too boring. And you guys don't fall asleep because you look hungry. Like you are looking at me like, dude, we have sat here, we've waited, she's out, you're out, dismiss us so we can eat. I'm coming. So what ended up happening, um, it's the last year. Like everything's done, everything's ended, and um, she's graduating. So I came to the conclusion that if I tell her I like her and she rejects me, I never have to see her again. She's graduating, she's going back to Denver. I was graduating that fall, so I never have to see her again. So that was my game plan. That way, you know, okay, maybe some of you don't know because the majority of you are married, but for those of you who are single and are still trying to figure it out, imagine rejecting someone and then every day you wake up and you have to see them and you're in the same age, you're in the same class. So my game plan was like, if she says no, yeah, she's gone. So I don't have to see her again. So I tell her one evening, it's absolutely hilarious. I tell her, hey, I really like you. And this was her response, thank you. Wow. So one of my friends asked me, so how did it go, bro? I'm like, hmm. I don't preaching at a church in Los Angeles. Um, we have a Miracle Center branch in Los Angeles. So my mom was preaching, and she's like, hey, come to LA, let's spend some time together. Um, it would be great to see you. So I go to see my mom. Me and Mar had been texting, and the plan was like, she's not coming back to Tulsa. She's done, she's back in Denver. So I didn't know when I was going to see her, because when I get done, I'm coming back here. So I was debating on like, hey, maybe I like travel or go see her or whatever, but I hadn't made up my mind. So one evening, my mom, we, we go to the mall and my mom's like, hey, let's, let's have dinner somewhere. So there was this really nice restaurant and it was outside the Beverly Center in Los Angeles. It's called Rio, so we went there. And again, I know this might go over some of people's heads, but um, in the Kayanja family, like, we talk a lot. Like, we talk about everything. Um, yes, a lot. <laughs> so, my mom sits down, she says, you know, Rob, you know, when I met your dad, and he asked me out, he didn't have everything, and he took his shot, and I didn't know where my mom was going with this, because if, how many of you have ever had like the whole dating conversation with your mom? Your dad's is different, but your mom's is like, so I didn't know where, the, where she was going with this at the restaurant. So she goes down this list of, you know, so in life, you just have to try. And I was like, this is, I didn't know whether it was God, because she had no clue. And I'm coming to that part of how she had no clue. I'm coming. So I get back, we get back to the hotel, I'm laying on my bed, and then it dawns on me, like, just buy the ticket and go. So I bought the ticket with my mom. Like, she was next door, she didn't know. Bought the ticket, I'm gonna go to Denver, and I'll see. Like, worst case scenario, I haven't told anybody yet. So again, if this doesn't work out, I failed quietly. 
Um, we know some people who try some things out and everyone knows they've tried and it's just not working. So, now what was funny about that restaurant, me and my dad went there in LA, same restaurant, in the spring of, no, the fall of 2014. And um, I think it was fall 2014, but we went to the same restaurant and um, my dad kind of had the same conversation with me there too. But that was like years before my mom had the same conversation. So pretty much I, I tell two people I am going to Denver, two. One of them was Caleb Worley, the other was Aaron Johnson. Both of them my mentors, and they were both my bosses, because I was working at Victory um, Christian Center, which is right across the street from ORU. And um, I sat down with Caleb and his wife, they invited me for lunch, and they told me their entire story, how they got together and everything. And then they were like, you know, I think before you leave, you'll find the right person. Now, in my head, I'm like, you know, I hope everything all of you people are saying is right. Because you're all anointed, so this really has to work out. Because I don't know. But they didn't, he didn't know I was going to see Mar yet. So I have a meeting with him and AJ, and I tell him I'm going to Denver. And the funniest things that they do is that they write me a list. Now, this is where it's going to get interesting. If you're single, can you please raise your hand? Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Just raise your hand if you're single. Okay, cool. I want you to take notes now. This is where you take notes. The most important part of the entire speech. This is where you take notes. So they gave me a list, not lying to you. This was about a page and a half of all the things to tick off. The first, like 10 things were the most important in choosing someone. So I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm going through this list, I'm looking at it, and I remember something my dad said. He said, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And then he followed that statement by, not he who finds a girlfriend, not he who finds a friend, it's he who finds a wife. So I'm looking at this whole list. I'm on the flight to Denver. I tell him, okay, are you sure about this list? Because all the, the top things on the list were not about her. They were about her family. So go there. All the things on the list check off. We haven't got to anything about her yet. I call them back, I'm like, okay, we got the top things you listed, they're all good to go, they're great. And you know what they said? Oh, then everything else is gonna be fine for sure. And they were 100% confident. So, the fun story now is, everything in Denver goes great, she comes to Tulsa and sees me, and then I come back here, and she is going to take a job in Korea. Not the North Korea, the South one. Some, I saw some people looking at me like, eh? I don't know. Robert, are you still sure there's time? <laughs> some of you over there just... Anyway. Um, so, COVID happens, and my plan was, you know, you go back, graduation, all that stuff, I'll go see her. Then COVID happens, and we're stuck here. And then she moves to Korea, and she's stuck where she is. And during that time, I am, I am not a very outwardly emotionally, um, emotional person. I, um, I have a good grasp on my emotions. However, today, you watch, you watch my parents when they're talking about the family tree. This is the first time I've seen them stubborn. My dad has never stubborn anywhere. He's talking from the president. And this is the first time. My dad was like nervous, and I don't know why, I'm the one talking. And he was nervous. So was my mom, but I digress. So, <laughs> he's looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, she moves, I come back here, and all we can do, remember when I said you, you should be taking notes? All you single people, this is the most important thing. All we could do for a year and a half is talk. That's it. We couldn't do anything else but talk. And leading up to that, I knew I wanted to marry her because of this one simple thing. We, 
when I went a period of time, which is about 48 hours, without talking to her, because I am my father's son, and I know some of you big people, you like, you text my dad, and then he replies like on Tuesday. Like, you say hello, then on Tuesday next week, he's like, hey, what happened? Or you call him and you're waiting for him to pick up, right? I'm the exact same way. So, she was like, Rob, you need to work on your communication. And I'm like, ah. and at the time, I'm, I'm a very stubborn person, like all Kayanja men. Well, there are two of us that are speaking, but we're stubborn. So I was like, yeah, I really don't want to. So we didn't talk for like 48 hours. This is the first time in my life where my dad has seen me unstable. Like we were in the office, I was laying down, I was like walking into doors that were closed. It was like, it was bad, because I was like, you know what? This is the person for me, 110%. So we talk all the way through COVID. And on my birthday, I don't celebrate my birthday. Um, the reason why I do not celebrate my birthday is because I believe my birthday is the day I was born. And if my birthday is for me, let me just relax by myself and not do anything. And by relax, I go to work with my dad. So I don't really celebrate my birthday. So she got one of, one of the guys I work with to get me a cake, beautiful cake. And I come into the office and I'm shook because this is a person in COVID who has managed to get me a birthday cake. My dad looks over and he's like, yeah, it's the right person. Then a few months later, she gets my dad a cake. I had no idea about it. The cake shows up at the church, all set, all prepared. And um, long story short, to cut everything down, she had a great job in Korea, quits it to move here. So all you men, simply put, I have proof, if they won't move for you, they're not for you. I know that's a whole sermon I'll preach one day, but simply put. And I um, moved here with, and, and this, this is, this, she'll tell the story, her story one day, but I need to say it because it meant a lot to me. There was no guarantee we would get here when she moved here. But we're here. So... It was, not it, this, her, is, the greatest blessing I have personally ever received. And I'm a practical person, not everyone is perfect, I'm not perfect, shock's not perfect, the spokesperson for that family is not perfect. But she's pretty close, like 99.999%. And the reason why I don't have 100% is because, well, I'm 27 years old. I'm not like 80, like some of you. No offense. So there are some things that I'll know in a few years that, you know what, this is the perfect person. Because there's a lot about myself I still need to learn. And also fix, because like I told you, we are a stubborn bunch. But I'm extremely grateful because as I can't go through everything, a whole family along the way has been able to give very strong and sound advice. And I think the best advice that I got was you won't have an answer or a plan to everything but that shouldn't stop you from taking any form of action and we're proof that long distance does work if it's not working for you well somewhere along the line one of you doesn't want it to work because we wanted it to work. And um, I have to give her so much credit. I am not trying to cry, so I am looking this way. The reason I'm not looking this way, not trying to cry. One Kayanja family member has to, to hold tears for today, and it's going to be me, hopefully. I have like three more minutes in this speech, I'm trying. So I'm, I'm, I'm looking this, I'm not looking back. 
but I can't imagine. Oh, this is great. This is a great story. We talked, and she's like, I'm moving there. Awesome. Great. I'm quitting my job. Then our parents met over Zoom. They met over Zoom. She's looking at me like, bro, what? They met over Zoom. Her daughter is moving to another country with a family she's never met, with a guy who told her, I like her, and she said, thank you. That's the prefix of, that's the practical side of the story. And they met over Zoom, and my dad was on the Zoom for three minutes. He gets off the Zoom, and I'm like, Dad, you're not going to say, he's like, no, I'm at peace with the whole thing. And then he walks out to have a meeting. And our moms hit it off, and that was amazing. Her family is amazing. It takes a lot to have your daughter move and you not be there, you not know anything over some Ugandan preacher's boy. And if you're a single prominent person, the beauty about her is that she didn't know anything about all of you people and him. You know, that guy, she had no clue. I undersold everything. I said, my dad's a pastor. We have a small church in the middle of, I, I undersold every single thing. She got shocked when she came here, pure culture shock. And the church was empty during COVID and it was still a lot to take in. And she stuck it out. She's here. She's absolutely amazing. To publicly tell people, well actually no, to tell all of you because your family and friends. Um, one of the things on the list that they gave me was this. And this was number five on the list. My dad talked about legacy. If I'm to continue a legacy, and I know some people will wonder why I've brought this up and said it the way I said it. But if I was to continue a legacy, and something tragic happened to me while carrying on the legacy. On that line of questioning was, would you trust that person to take care of every member of your family and the people you are responsible for and everything you inherit? I remember ticking that box without hesitation. And if you're a person who you have responsibility, that is the most important thing. Her and my father get along extremely well to the point where the only problem we have is that they occasionally together gang up on me for my dietary habits. And it brings me joy to know that regardless of what happens, my family is also in good hands. Uh, lastly, I'm going to ask every single person to stand up, if you will.